All right, welcome back to part two. On this, I'm going to get through, um, try to get through problems 11 through 20. So this one deals with um, equations of lines that are parallel, or sorry, perpendicular or parallel to this one. Again, that has to do with slope. So the slope of that line is 7. So parallel has the same slope. Um, so it, the, a parallel slope would be 7, right? A perpendicular slope, remember that's where we do the negative reciprocal, that would be flip it to make it 1 over 7 and change the sign. So if you're looking at how they want you to plug that in, we're basing it on that slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b. They've already got the y-intercepts. Right, they've already got negative two, negative eleven. So all we're looking at is that mx, the slope times the uh, the variable x. So the perpendicular one, what's going to go in for m is negative one over seven. So you got to punch in negative one over seven x, and the parallel is where I use the same slope. So that's just going to be seven x. So that problem, if you remember this stuff about parallel lines and perpendicular lines having um, either the same slope or negative reciprocals, um, then that should be a pretty easy problem to do. Not really a whole lot of calculations on that one. Okay, in this question, we're going to solve for the value of x um, if we want these triangles to be congruent. So um, now you're going to have to match up here corresponding parts. So you'll notice in this triangle that that angle with the 2x plus 8 and that angle that's 78 includes that side ZY. So what that means is Z is going to have to correspond to C. Right? Z and C have to go together because that 78 there is going to have to go with that um, 78 up there. So Y has to go with B. Z has to go with C in order to keep that side in between the angles, which means a is going to go with x, right? So this angle is 40. Now, if that's the case, then how do we set up an equation to solve for x? Because there's nothing for me to set that equal to. And what we can do is we can actually figure out the measure of angle C right there because in this triangle, the angles have to add it to 180. So C is going to be 180 minus 78 plus 40. That's 180 minus 118, uh, which would be 62. So this angle C is 62, which is going to be what Z has to be equal to. So that 2x plus 8 has to equal 62. So if we solve that for x, we're going to subtract 8 from both sides. Um, that'll give us 2x equals... What would that be? 54. And then you divide both sides by 2. That gives you x equals 27. So, x equals 16 results in congruent triangles. That's false. x equals 27 results in congruent triangles. That's true. Uh, x equals 31 does not... This is kind of a trick question. It's like a double negative. Does not result in congruent triangles. That will be true because if x is 31, these angles aren't going to match up. And pardon the bad grammar, but that's um, they're not going to be congruent triangles because for triangles to be congruent, all the corresponding parts have to be equal. Or congruent is the term we should use. Okay, this question, they're telling me that uh, CB is bisecting angle ACD, so this angle right here is an angle bisector. That means these two angles are the same. Um, they want me to find the measure of angle BCD. Well, easy enough. It's going to be the same as ACD. It's also 30 because that's what it means to bisect an angle is that you cut it into two congruent parts. So again, uh, that blue line right there is bisecting that angle ACD. So that's got to be 30. 
next question. Um, given triangle GHI and JKL, um, let's draw a picture of this, right? GHI, JKL. All right, and let's fill in these numbers. GI is 5, uh, HI is 4, JK is 4, and JL is 5. So it says, what else do you need to know to, to prove the two triangles are congruent using HL? So HL requires us to have right triangles so that um, their hypotenuses are congruent and then they have a pair of legs. Okay, um, if this is all that I know, then I need um, one of these angles to be a right angle and then... Either the 4 or 5 can be the hypotenuse. Right? Because HL, I need a hypotenuse and I need a leg. So, in a right triangle, you've got to remember that the longest side has to be the hypotenuse. Right? The, the longest side has to be opposite from the biggest angle. So, here the longest side is 5, which means K. And this is not at all drawn to scale, obviously. But K has to be the right angle. And over here, H has to be the right angle, right? So if that's the case, then these two triangles would be congruent by HL because there's a hypotenuse and there's the leg. So there you go. So we need to know the angles um, H, I guess that's the letter you put in there, H and K are right angles. All right, um, now this question, what do they want us to do? They want us to kind of do this proof um, that these two triangles are congruent to each other, ABD to CBD. So let's mark in this triangle what's given to us. So we're given that AB is congruent to BC. Um, and we're given that BD is the perpendicular bisector of uh, ABC. So, or sorry, they did not write that properly. How can you be a perpendicular bisector of an angle? I think what they mean there is it's a perpendicular bisector of AC. So that means this is in the middle, and that's a right angle, and that's a right angle. So what we're using here is, um, if you'll notice, these. this is a hypotenuse of that right triangle. That's the hypotenuse of the other right triangle. There's a leg, there's a leg. So we can apply HL to these two triangles. Now, uh, okay, this is a rather silly way of doing it. They're not using those as the legs. They're just using the right angles. Anytime we have this, though, BD is equal to BD. They're talking about they're sharing that side. So that's the pair of legs between those two triangles to do HL. And anytime we got something equal to itself, that's always the reflexive, is what we usually call it. Here they decide to call it the reflective property, and I don't think they do that anywhere else in the book. So whoever typed that up was just in a different world. So anyway, that's the reflexive property. So I'm going to put A there. Now we know that those are right angles because that's the definition of really just perpendicular. And then that last one, then, the triangles are congruent by HL. So, it's not how I would approve that one, but there you go. That's what they chose to do. That's fine. Oops. Uh, next question. Number 16. So, we're here we're trying to determine whether a triangle can be formed with the given side lengths and then classified as uh, isosceles equilateral um, or neither. So our rule for this is uh, the triangle inequality theorem, which says if I've got any triangle, then the sum of any two sides, so like AB plus BC, has to be greater than the third side, AC. Or the sum of BC plus AC has to be bigger than AB. Or um, AB plus AC must be bigger than um, BC. So any two sides have added together have to be more than the, the third. So 
I, I can fill in these numbers here, it doesn't really matter. And I look for a problem, and if you remember as we went over this, we learned, if I just take the smaller two and add them together, and then compare them to that third side, if they're not strictly greater than that third side, then you can't make a triangle out of it. So 3 plus 2, how does that compare to 7? Is it greater than 7? And the answer there is no, because 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 is not greater than 7. So this one you say no, so the side lengths will not form a triangle. Or it might say like, uh, hopefully this is something like not form a triangle, or neither an equilateral or isosceles, or any triangle for that matter. So it won't form a triangle. Those two sides don't add up to more than 7. Um, here's another one. Same concept, right? I've got this triangle. 4, 4, and 6, does this work? Well, is 4 plus 4 greater than 6? And the answer is, yeah, 8 is greater than 6. So, yes, this will form a triangle. Um, and then it just determ we determine what kind it is. And this comes down to knowing your definitions. All right, this triangle has two sides congruent, so we call that isosceles. It's got at least two sides congruent we call isosceles. So this is, will form an isosceles triangle. Um, number 18. So this one, we're trying to find all these angle measurements. And this just has to do with, um, basically, the interior angles add up to 180. And then we also have, whenever we have an exterior angle, we have the extra angle theorem that we can use that says, hey, that angle on the outside has to equal the sum of the two remote interior angles. So that's equal to those two added together. So let's fill in the given parts here. Angle 2 is 72. Um, angle 1 is 2 times the measure of angle 3. 4 is equal to 8. Let's fill that in there. These two are equal. Um, so we're supposed to find all these angle measurements. Well, let's deal with that first thing there, that 4 is equal to 8. If you look at these three, right, 2, 4, and 8. They're making a straight line if I add them together, so they're going to have to add it to 180. Um, since angle 2 is 72, I'm going to plug that in there. And then 4 and 8 are the same, right? That's what they told me. So I can change this right here to angle 4 plus angle 4. So that's 2 times the measure of angle 4. Now if I subtract 72 from both sides, I get the measure of angle 4, or sorry, 2 times the measure of angle 4, then is 108. And then if I divide both sides by 2, That will give me the measure of angle 4 is equal to 54. And that's also the same as angle 8, too, right? So 8 is 54. 4 is also 54. Now I'm going to add that to the picture because that will be helpful. 54. 54. Now I can figure out angle 7 because that right angle box means that's 90. And then angle 7 is just going to be inside that triangle. They've all got to add up to 180. So we also talked about how in right triangles, since that angle is 90, the two acute angles must add up to 90. So a quicker way to find angle 7 is just do 90 minus 54, which is, uh, what, 36? So angle 7 is 36. Now... Where do we go from there? Um, now we're told angle 1 is 2 times the measure of angle 3. Well, if I look at these triangles, I'm going to kind of do the same thing. Right? That we did over here. So, if 1 and 3 are the same, or sorry, if angle 1 is twice the measure of angle 3, 
You know what? Let's just write this out. Angle 1 plus angle 3 plus 72, because that's what angle 2 is. Those three angles also have to add up to, oops, 180. Wow, what's going on? Let's try that again. Computers having spasms. So angle 1 plus angle 2. Um, wait, why is all this here? Hold on. Okay, got all that fixed. Anyway, so these three angles, here, here, and here, they've got to add up to 180. And I'm going to substitute angle 1. Uh, for angle 1, I'm going to put in 2 times the measure of angle 3. So 2 measures of angle 3 plus the measure of angle 3 plus 72. You know what? Let's do this. At the same time, I'm going to add... I'm going to subtract 72 from both sides. So this equation then becomes, right, that's gone. So I got angle, two angle threes plus angle three equals, that's 108. That gives me three angle threes is equal to 108. And if I divide both sides by three, okay, that will give me that angle three is equal to 30 sticks. So, angle 3 then is 36. Angle 1 is 2 times. That's 2 times the measure of angle 3, right? So 2 times 36 gives you 72. So that angle 72. And then we can figure out angle 5 because it's an exterior angle. So it's going to be equal to the sum of those two. Let's fill these in. 1 is 72. 3 is 36. Uh, so yeah, so angle 5 is going to be 72 plus 72. Which gives me 144. So angle 5 is 144. Angle 6, right, it's going to be equal to the sum Let's change colors. It's going to be equal to the sum of those two added together because those are the two remote interior angles there. So angle 6 is going to be uh, 72 plus 36, which is 108. So that one took a minute, but there's all the angles. I mean, it should. There's eight angles there. But there are all the angles for that uh, little setup of triangles there. All right. Uh, 19. Uh, this one actually came off of another quiz, another review, but look, we've got a seven-sided polygon. And what we learned about polygons in Chapter 7 was that what all the interior angles add up to, right? In a triangle, they add up to 180, but anything, actually, for we use that to learn that for all polygons, it's depending on the number of sides. So... Um, the formula there for the total is n minus 2 times 180, where n represents the number of sides. So here that number is 7. That ends up being 5 times 180, which is 900. So all the angles on the inside have to add up to 900. That makes this statement true. That makes B false, because it's not 1260, it's 900. And then each interior angle is 135. They can really be anything. They don't have to be 135. The only way they are all going to be the same is if it's a regular uh, polygon. And they don't tell me that this is regular. But even if it was regular, and I did 900 that splits up seven ways, that does not give you 135. It gives you like 120-something. So, two reasons why that's not true. All right, one more, and then I'll have to separate it and go to the next video. So here's number 20. Right, this one says that ABC is an equilateral triangle. So here's ABC. If it's equilateral, that means all the sides are the same. So it says AB is 4x plus 45. BC is 6x minus 3. They don't give me an expression for AC, but it's going to be equal to either of those. But since we know it's equilateral and we know the sides are the same, then I can actually set up this equation where those two sides are equal to each other. All right? If I solve this for x, let's see what we get. I'm going to add 3 to both sides. 
I'm going to subtract 4x from both sides. That way I'll have all my x's on the left. And, or all the x uh, terms on the left. I get 2x. And then on the right, see those cancel, those cancel. On the right I get 48. If you divide both sides by 2, you get x equals 24. So, a true. Um, if I plug this back in to actually find the side lengths, let's plug that in. Uh, 24 times 6. 24 times 6. Let's see, that'll be 4 times 2. That'll be 144 minus 3 because that minus 3 there it gives me 141. So, that's true. And then. The distance from one vertex of the triangle to the midpoint of an adjacent side is 12. So here's what they're getting at there. Um, they're saying if I draw in this line right here, that's a median, it's going to go to the midpoint of that side. So what we would have is this is 144. This got split in half, so now that's 72. And they're wanting to know the length of that side right there. Well... If it's an equilateral triangle, then that means we've got a right triangle. And then I can do the Pythagorean theorem to where that median, let's just call that x. So we got x squared plus 72 squared equals 144 squared. Well, that means x is going to be the square root of, because I'm going to have to square root both sides. And then subtract 72 squared from both sides first. So 144 squared minus um, 72 squared. Plug that in your calculator and see what you get. Hang on, I just realized that's supposed to be 141. So that changes the math a little bit. I think you get like the square root of like 14,000 or something. Either way, that's not equal to 12. That's false. I'm not sure where they got that from. Okay, so check back in a bit for part three where I will go over 21 through 29.